I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Hey Lurkers, welcome to this week's episode. I thought I would bring you another Missing 411 case this week because I don't think that we've done one super recently. This one takes place in Canada, in the Yukon Territory. I didn't actually plan on picking a case that ended up being so close to the area that we were just talking about, that being the Alaska Triangle. Um, But when I read the details of this case, I was kind of intrigued. So in this episode, we're going to be covering the case of Bart Schleyer. Bart went missing on September 14th, 2004. But unlike some of our other cases, his remains were found on October 4th of the same year. Before we get into the disappearance part, we need to cover the life history of Bart because knowing his background and history really is what makes this case kind of odd. It's not the only thing, but it's a big part of why this is odd. So Bart Schleyer was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming, March 5th, 1955, to Dr. Otis and Lula Rose Schleyer. Bart's father was a doctor and an avid hunter, and he took Bart on his first hunting trip when he was just four years old. Dr. Schleyer actually had Bart tied in the back seat of his Jeep while they chased antelope. I imagine that must have been an incredibly fun time for a four-year-old. To be tied in the back of a Jeep, probably with the top off, racing around places, chasing antelope. Honestly, I think it would be great fun for me as an adult. Maybe not the tied into the Jeep part, but the riding around like a lunatic chasing antelope sounds like uh, something I would like to do. At the age of just 10, Bart went on an African safari with his dad to Mozambique. Bart made other trips to Africa at the ages of 13 and 17. At the age of 18, he was introduced to bow hunting and it was said he never hunted with a gun again. Bart's sister, Claudia Downey, described Bart as being obsessed with animals as a child. She said, He didn't just like them. He wanted to know everything about them, study where they lived and how they lived. And Bart was something of an artist. His sister said as a kid he loved drawing pictures of animals, and that continued into adulthood. He pursued art until he transferred from art school to the Montana State University. He earned both a bachelor's and a master's degree in wildlife biology. His thesis was on grizzly bear activity in Yellowstone. From 1979 to 1991, he worked as project biologist for Montana's interagency grizzly bear study team at Montana State. During that time, he learned live trapping skills and became a master at luring bears into culvert traps, fitting them with radio collars, and tracking them. Just so you know what I'm talking about, a culvert trap is made from a large metal tube that they typically use for culverts. They're usually placed on a trailer with the open end of the trap at the ramp. The bear goes into the tube to get the bait, and once it pulls the bait, the door closes. You've probably seen them. If you've seen any type of wildlife show about bears or trapping bears, you've seen them. One of the studies Bart was involved in was designed to figure out what bears did when disturbed by hikers. His research partner said, Bart's job was to get close enough to jump the bears out of their beds. He got chased up quite a few trees over the years. A lot of people thought what he did was insane, but he loved his job, and he worked hard at it. He also worked hard at staying in shape. 
I think one would need to be in shape if you're constantly in a position to get chased by a bear and shimmy up a tree. If I got chased by the bear, I would definitely need to have somebody much slower than myself. Um, because my fat ass isn't going up the tree. After spending days out in the field, Bart would go back home where he would do hundreds of push-ups, sit-ups, and squats with logs on his shoulders. I read one piece of information that said he actually carved out the logs in order to be used for this purpose. In 1985, he was recruited by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks for a grizzly study. The areas where they would be trapping were thickly forested, and they were unable to use culvert traps. Instead, they used horses and backpacks to haul leg-hold snares. 30 to 40 days in, he was backpacking 80 pounds of snares and raw meat. He became an expert at trapping. Everyone said that when the bears were drugged, he treated them like they were his children. He made sure that they were safe. In 1991, Bart moved to Wasilla, Alaska, which is just north of Anchorage, and he worked as a taxidermist. A colleague said Bart was physically like a Neanderthal. Intellectually, he was brilliant. Spiritually, he loved being out in the wildest parts of Alaska. While in Alaska, he became a gifted moose caller. Then, in 1993, he was recruited to trap Siberian tigers for the Hornocker Wildlife Institute Wildlife Conservation Society Siberian Tiger Project in the Russian Far East. For nine years, Bart lived in Russia, trapping tigers and putting tracking collars on them. John Goodrich, the Tiger Project field coordinator, said, I don't like using the word trapper to describe Bart because his skills went far beyond being able to get an animal to step in a trap. Bart excelled in dealing with them once they were caught. He had an innate sense about animals and their behavior and had tremendous compassion for them. While in Russia, Bart met a Russian woman named Tatiana who also worked on the project. Together they had a son. 1995 brought Bart and his family back to Alaska. It's safe to say that basically every job he worked involved capturing large carnivores and then releasing them back into the wild. Because of this, Bart was the best in his field. Really, he was considered the best trapper in the world, with experience trapping and releasing bears, tigers, leopards, and lynx. Eventually, Bart began to feel penned in by the encroaching civilization of Alaska, so he moved to Whitehorse in the Yukon. Late summer, Bart called his father and his girlfriend Tatiana and his son to tell them that he was going out to the bush to hunt moose. He was in high spirits and looking forward to this trip. He hired a pilot to take him to Upper Reed Lake on September 14, 2004. He planned to stay for two weeks. He was well equipped for the trip with enough food for at least two weeks, clothing, and camping gear such as a tent and an inflatable boat. Reed Lakes is on the southern slope of the Selwyn Mountains, about 175 miles north of Whitehorse where Bart lived. The nearest settlement is Stewart Crossing, which is 15 miles away. The mountains are home to numerous large animals, including doll sheep, moose, caribou, and black and grizzly bears. The Selwyns were virtually unexplored and unmapped until after World War II. At present, hikers, naturalists, trappers, outfitters, hunters, fishermen, and exploration geologists are seasonal visitors. So then on September 28th, you know, just so you know, September 14th, Bart gets dropped off by the pilot he hired. He's going to stay for two weeks. So now, September 28th, the pilot returned to pick Bart up to take him home. But upon arriving at the camp, Bart was nowhere to be found. The pilot contacted the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who came in to see what was going on. 
they found that Bart had only eaten one meal and had not yet started a fire, which led them to believe that whatever happened, happened the first day. Most of Bart's food, minus the one meal that he ate, was still there at camp. Further investigation led them to discover his raft a half a mile from camp, and it was theorized that he used the boat, paddled it down the lake from camp, and might have hiked out to the highway. But some inclement weather forced them to end the search. Dib Williams, Bart's friend in Whitehorse, was not happy with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police search. So he got his friend Wayne Curry, a pilot, to fly them to the campsite. Upon arrival to the camp, Dib Williams noted that all the food was still there in their crates. They also found Bart's tent that had been knocked down, either by wind or animals. And they found all the equipment still in the tent. A search around the camp led them to find Bart's backpack, bear spray, a knife, and a VHF radio. This caused Williams and Curry to become increasingly concerned as they did not believe that Bart had hiked out when he left such key equipment behind. On the second day of their search, Williams and Curry found Bart's bow, his arrows in a handmade buckskin quiver, and a dry bag full of gear near the inflatable boat. The hunting equipment was found about 60 yards back in the woods from where Bart's boat was found, leaned up against a tree on flat ground. Curtis, an experienced moose hunter, said the area looked like a place an archer might set up if he was trying to hunt. A camouflage face mask with blood and hair on it was also found nearby, so Williams and Curry decided to call in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police back to the area. On October 3rd, the RCMP resumed the search for BART. RCMP, Yukon Conservation Officers, and civilian volunteers began a more detailed grid search. The search team found a baseball cap, camouflage pants, a camera, part of a skull, and just a few small bones. All these items were about 60 meters from where Bart's bow was found. The search team also found wolf and bear tracks in the area. The teeth in the skull allowed it to be identified as Bart's using dental records. The skull and a few small bones were all that was found of Bart. Since there were grizzly bear tracks found nearby, it was speculated that Bart might have been killed and eaten by a grizzly. This is not unheard of. In 2006, Timothy Treadwell was killed by a grizzly bear and his death was captured on video. The grizzly bear is native to the Yukon Territory and can weigh up to 800 pounds. But some searchers were skeptical that it was a bear attack. Bone fragments were found in the bear scat from the area, but no fabric was found. In case you're not sure or you don't know, bears don't stop to undress their kills prior to eating them. In other cases of bear attack on humans, both human remains and large amounts of clothing are found. Again, because bears don't undress their kills. I mean, how do they work the buttons without opposable thumbs? There were also no signs of a struggle. The area was covered with soft, easily disturbed moss. A bear attack is usually a prolonged and violent event and yet there was no sign at all of any kind of attack. Back to the moss for a moment. If you've ever been hiking or you've ever been anywhere where moss has been growing, I'm sure you might have noticed how easy it is to disturb. Moss doesn't have a root system like other plants, making it easy to move and disturb. If you're a hiker, you should be familiar with the leave no trace principles and one thing mentioned is being careful not to mess up an area. And one area that is mentioned to be especially careful of are mossy areas. So we have no clothing, no sign of a struggle. Bear also usually bury their kills in something called a cache. However, this was not the case with Bart. 
His remains were found in a little patch of sparse spruce, lying on the moss. Bart's pants showed very little blood and hair. If it was a bear attack, the pants would likely be shredded and soaked in blood. The pathology report found no tooth punctures in Bart's skull, nor indications of scratch marks from teeth. Bears almost always go for the head when attacking people. The evidence pointed more towards scavenging after Bart died. For me, one of the strangest things, and yes, it's stranger than a bear stripping its meal, is that the food was still sitting there at camp. The food was stored in several action packer crates. I looked these up. They are Rubbermaid crates made from plastic that are able to be locked with a padlock. I've read through the reviews and the questions and answers, just to get an idea of the durability of the container. It is not rated as bear-proof. One person stated that a squirrel was able to easily chew through the lid of his container. Those who might not be hikers or backpackers in bear country may wonder why this is significant. When you're in bear country, it's important to keep your food, toiletries, or anything with any kind of odor in an, odor in an odor-proof container, either a bear canister or odor-proof bag. A bear's sense of smell is considered to be the best of any animal. Dogs, in general, have a sense of smell 100 times better than a human's. Specifically, a bloodhound has a sense of smell 300 times better than a human. Bears have a sense of smell 2100 times better than a human's sense of smell. A bear would have undoubtedly smelled the crates of food at the campsite and would have to, at the very least, attempted to open the crates. A bear shouldn't have had any issue with opening those crates and would have been able to get to the food. It's a free meal prior to the winter and a hungry bear won't pass that up. Yet the crates of food sat there completely untouched by anything for over two weeks. So what happened to Bart Schleyer? Was it a bear attack? Wolf attack? My opinion is no, that he didn't die from an actual attack. The other possibility is that he died suddenly from a heart attack or something like an aneurysm. And while that is certainly a good possibility, it doesn't explain why Bart's pants were not on him, and it doesn't explain where the rest of his clothes were because, if you remember, they found a pair of pants. And the pants had very little blood on them. It didn't have much on them at all. And they were found off to the side. They weren't kind of grouped together with everything. His shirt wasn't found. His, none of his other clothing were found other than the baseball cap and, like, the ski mask he was wearing to keep warm. So where is his shirt? Where is his coat? Where is that stuff? It wasn't in any of the scat that was found in the area. By scat, I mean poop. It wasn't in the bear poop. It wasn't in the wolf poop. Which is significant because typically when they kill something, they eat, they eat everything. Fabric, flesh, everything all at once. But back to the possibility of a, some sort of sudden event like a heart attack or something. Um, Bart was 49 years old and he was considered to be in good health. He was extremely active and he exercised all the time. Remember, he would be out in the field for days, weeks, and come back and do hundreds of push-ups and sit-ups and squats with a big giant log on his shoulders. The man made sure he was in shape because he needed to be in shape for his job. So while it's possible he had some type of health event why did he take off his clothing where did his clothing go and was he really a candidate for something like a heart attack a spokeswoman for the mounties and whitehorse said the case actually remains open but the organization is leaning towards the idea that bart was attacked and killed by a bear they stated there is no sign or reason to think that there was any kind of foul play 
I find it hard to accept that someone with the knowledge and experience in dealing with large carnivores and being considered the best bear trapper in the world could be surprised by a bear. And I don't think a bear would just leave food sitting around for two weeks completely untouched at the campsite. In the end, who really knows? I believe this line from Bart's obituary says it best. Bear and wolf sign were discovered in the area, and whether or not he was killed by a bear or died of some other cause is, and always will, remain a mystery. And with that, we're going to bring this episode to a close. I am sorry that it's a little bit shorter than a normal episode, but I've had an incredibly busy week and I really liked this particular case and wanted to share it because I don't know if you can hear it, but the turtle in the room is back there making noises because she thinks that she needs to be fed. (laughs) Anyway, um, what I was saying was I thought this was kind of intriguing. The thing that intrigued me the most, if you are a backpacker or a hiker, you have to learn how to hang your food. And what I mean is you have to put it in an odor proof container, like uh, something called a bear canister, or I have these Loctite odor proof bags. They're, you know, they have a little picture of a bear on it with the, the universal symbol of no, because bears are not supposed to be able to smell through them and you put that in a dry sack and you basically tie a piece of like rope or paracord to it and you chuck it over a branch and you string it up on a tree so that the bears can't reach it. I'm shortening that down. It's a little bit more involved with with it than that. Um, I am really not very good at bear bags. I would probably lose my food to a bear and starve to death on the trail. But anyway, you need to be very careful about that because bears are incredibly good at getting your food. And here you had two weeks worth of food sitting in a camp completely unattended by a person because at that point it was assumed that Bart had died. Whatever happened to him happened the first day. So for two weeks there's food sitting at camp. No humans around. And the bears, those are not odor-proof containers that they are in. They're just regular Rubbermaid containers. They're not rated as being bear-proof. It's actually one of the things that it says in the ad that I looked. I actually looked them up on the REI website, which is a, REI is an outfitter for backpacking and all kinds of outdoor type activities. Cycling, hiking, backpacking all that stuff. So it's not rated as being bear proof. Bears would be able to get into the container probably pretty easily. And if not getting into them, they would be able to mangle the containers and at least be knocking them around. But that there was nothing like that. They were sitting there completely untouched. And for me, that was probably the strangest part of this story. I mean, Bart is experienced but he's not perfect. He's human. So eh, I don't think it's likely that he was attacked or surprised by a bear, but I think it, it, you know, there is a probability there, but I find it hard to believe that with that much bear scat and, and wolf scat and, you know, prints and everything, You have too many hungry animals roaming around and there's a smorgasbord of two weeks worth of food sitting there waiting to be eaten that nobody's even bothering to touch. Why the heck didn't they even try? I think that's the thing that really makes me wonder that and what the heck happened to his clothes? You know, bears don't undress their kills, neither do wolves. And also to point out, wolf attacks on humans are like so incredibly rare. It's not even really in the realm of possibility that he was attacked by wolves. So you've got this food sitting untouched. You have missing clothing. What the heck happened? 
Anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. As always, you can find episodes of Lurk wherever it is that you listen to your favorite podcast or at lurkpodcast.com. On the website, you can also find links to our social media accounts. You should definitely like or follow us on one of those to see photos pertaining to our episodes. Also, as I have mentioned before, if you're interested in purchasing the Missing 411 books by David Polites, do not look them up on Amazon. David Polites sells these books himself on his website, and I will make sure that I include the website information in the show notes for this episode, and I will also try to remember to post it on social media just so anybody who is interested can find them where they're listed for like $25 instead of like $250 or whatever. Also, a reminder, don't forget that September 24th is the Whitehall, New York Sasquatch Festival. We are planning on being there with some merchandise. We will have t-shirts, hopefully some hoodies, some other various things. Um, Stop by and say hey, at the very least, if you're in the area. Also, you can find merch at lurkpodcastmerch.com. The website was down for a bit. It is back up and running and operational for anybody who may have tried to look at stuff there. And um, that's it for information. And until next time, keep lurking.